Perfect. Okay, so yeah, um, we highlighted two of like the biggest players in the deal finder space. Usually, it's going to be a wholesaler, it's going to be uh, a realtor. Those are the two main things that I would suggest for new or beginner real estate investors there. Now again, there's for some reason, there's some battle like real estate agents versus wholesalers. And I don't think that's the case. Real estate agents and wholesalers, they both provide services to you as an investor, but they're different services. You know, when you're buying that property off market, distressed, you may look to a wholesaler. But if you're looking to kind of dispose of that property and you want the highest price and the least amount of headache, I'd probably look for a real estate agent. Now today I've brought you two, I've brought Gary Hibbert as well as Wade Scotland, and I think these are great resources for you to get started and I'd really appreciate you if you guys wanted to reach out and connect with them that way. Okay, sounds good? Yep. Perfect, so let's move on to the next member of our power team. What, uh, sorry about that. One more this way, yeah. Okay, so now we have a property. Let's say Wade or Gary, they helped you out. You got a property, you're like, woo, we're going on and we gotta manage this thing. So the two things I wanna highlight here is your property manager and your contractor. Because once you have a property, you're gonna have to manage it. I see too many people get a property, they're like, all right, I'm done. I'm an investor and they walk away and then they look back in a couple weeks, tenants ripped apart their property, it's falling down, nothing's getting fixed on it and it's not a good way to manage your investment. So the first thing I'd like to highlight is your property manager. Now don't get me wrong, you can very easily manage your own properties, especially when you have a couple. But I did wanna highlight property managers because they're a great way for you to scale as well as understand a little bit more that goes on with the management of your property. They do more than just collect rent and kind of give it back to you. A good property manager will be knowledgeable about the area as well as have other resources to help you. Maybe they know a painter, maybe they know a contractor or a handyman, or maybe they know someone in the area that helps you that you need on uh, your investment property there. Ultimately, they're connected to businesses, vendors, and trades, and they're the boots on the ground team members, especially if you're looking to invest long distance, whether that's Timmins, Sudbury, or even farther away like Belleville. That's not like a, a close drive for most of us here. So they can be your boots on the ground, actually seeing that property, touching the, touching the bricks, and making sure things are going the way they wanna go. Um, they do come with fees, as most people do, and they're anywhere around six to 10%, but don't get me wrong, a good property manager is worth their weight in gold, especially if you can get them in that price range. Now, I would also caution you, there's a lot of really bad property managers out there because there's no licensing requirements. You know, as a real estate agent, you gotta do coursework, there's legal behind it, so like, you're gonna get service. But as a property manager, anyone can just be like, yeah, sure, I'll be a property manager today. So I wanna make sure you guys do your due diligence. Ask them those tough questions and make sure they're able to provide you the service that you want as a property manager. And next up, the contractor. Who's here is good with their hands? Where are all my flippers in the area? Ryan, put your hand up, you said you're a flipper. All right, okay. Well, I can tell you for sure I am not one of those guys. I told you, I can't hang a shelf up straight if you paid me. So this is why a contractor or a good handyman are perfect for your real estate investments. Now, even if you are handy, which I hope a lot of you guys are or get there, it's always nice to have a contractor or a handyman on your team. A couple things I want to highlight here. You can usually find contractors through referrals, and to be honest, I hope that's where you guys start. You can go on Google, you can go on Yelp, and you can look on like best contractors in the area. To be honest, you're not gonna get uh, the kind of service you think because I've been there. I had, uh, what was it, the first thing? I had a railing break, so I'm like, okay, I need a handyman, so I just went on like, uh, Home stars. I'm like, oh, this guy's good. He comes, he comes, uh, he looks at it, quotes me some outrageous price, like $750 to replace the, uh, replace the railing. But I don't know what I don't know. So I said, oh, okay, all right, that's a good price. And then I'm, I'm talking to some other people and someone's like, you paid what? <laughs> so when you have a referral, people who have already been in the business, like if you talk to me and it's like, oh, I, I refer him and he gave you a price like that, I'd be like, oh, that's legit versus you kind of just going out there by yourself and trying to come up with something there. So always use your referrals, you're gonna be a good way to get started there. Another thing, you always wanna be looking for new contractors. I found this out the hard way as well. You find one guy, he really likes it, perfect service, he invoices you really nice, he even scrubs it up, he shakes your hand of your tenant, you're like, wow, this guy's great. But then you call him in another four weeks, he's not available. The guys have other jobs, because he's good, right? So good people get good jobs. So he's busy doing a renovation for someone else, so I'm like, oh crap. I need one and I haven't been making any calls. So it's really important that even though you find one, keep that phone buzzing, keep those uh, referrals coming so you have enough contractors or handyman in your database so you can always get service on your property. Um, again, ask everyone you know. Uh, a lot of people like to keep their real estate investing as like their dirty little secret. And again, I did too when I started, but the more you're able to share and talk with people, the more high quality referrals you'll get so you're gonna be able to manage that property a little bit better. Finally, when you find one, 
treat them like gold. And I literally mean like gold gold. If they like, you know, bush light, that should be a case of bush light right there when they're done their job. You should pay them on time. Like the minute that last screw goes in, slide that invoice right in there. Like I'm talking, if they like football, they should have like Sunday football should be playing on the TV as they're doing their renovations there. Whatever you can do to go above and beyond to value your contractor is going to come back tenfold. Like think about it. Would you want to go to a property where like the guy pays you late, he doesn't really respect you, spells your name wrong? I'm sorry, JT. I'm sorry. I spelled your name wrong. That's my bad. So you can't do that. So you want to make sure you're really taking that time to show value or, or show that you appreciate them. And again, that's going to go uh, tenfold uh, in your property there. So again, property manage contractors. Next one up here. So we're going to talk about uh, our lenders here. We're going to actually have uh, Ashton come up and do a, a presentation for you guys here. So Ashton, why don't you come up and uh, get set up and I'll just kind of bring you up here. Uh, Ashton is one of the money men back there and he's going to speak about uh, the lending side and having a good lender on your team to be able to help fund your next deal and uh, work together there. So I'll get you queued up nice there buddy. and we'll get you started here. What's up guys, my name is Ashton Lambert. I'm a mortgage agent with Synergy Mortgage Group and a real estate investor myself. Our brokerage puts an emphasis on helping clients scale their real estate portfolio. If you're a real estate investor, you're gonna have multiple transactions over your lifespan. We wanna build relationships with our clients and take them from one property to two properties to five to 10 and so on and so forth. The way we do this is through expert advice, world-class servicing and long-term planning. Come on inside with me and spend a few minutes. I'm gonna share some tidbits on the mortgage side to help you start your rookie real estate investing career. There's tons of great mortgage agents out there and you have a lot of options when you look to take on a mortgage or numerous mortgages in your real estate investing career. One of the number one things you wanna look for though is someone with underwriting experience. An average mortgage agent will do around 20 to 25 files a year the average underwriter will see thousands a year. My suggestion is to work with someone who has underwriting experience. That way, they're gonna know where to place a file, they're gonna know where to place the next file, and as you grow your portfolio and maybe your mortgage application becomes a little bit tougher, they're gonna have the expertise and the underwriting knowledge to always be one step ahead for that next real estate transaction you're looking to take on. So the number one thing people always say is that obviously a bank has one product and a mortgage agent has many products. It's pretty obvious to me. I think one of the most important things is that you want someone who is 100% mortgages. It's what a mortgage agent is. You work with someone at the bank, there's a lot of great people there, but sometimes they're selling insurance, um, dealing with investments, maybe dabbling in mortgages. So number one thing that I think is the main difference is someone who is 100% mortgages and who can give you that expert advice that you're needing slash wanting to build your real estate portfolio. So I say this a lot, but proactive planning is one of the best ways to qualify for an investment property or any mortgage slash real estate transaction of any kind. Proactive planning will give you the ability to build out transactions in advance. Maybe you're wanting to buy in six months. Well, plan proactively and have a conversation with a mortgage agent to maybe identify any hurdles that could be addressed now and to at least set you up for when you want to pull the trigger on that initial purchase. Proactive planning also ties into, okay, you're buying a property well, maybe you want to refinance that property later down the road after you do some renovations to it. Well, make sure when you're working with someone, they're building out, hey, here's what you qualify for, for buying a property, but proactively, here's down the road what that transaction looks like when you potentially go to refinance. Credit's important, but don't fixate on your credit score. I've seen people with monthly payment obligations, two, three visas, two, three lines of credit, um, have great credit, and then on the opposite end, I've seen people with no debt obligations on a monthly basis have bad credit. So sometimes the scoring system can be a little skewed. So don't focus exactly on what your credit score is. Um, the main thing to consider is what are the actual debts you're carrying. So if you have a line of credit and there's a big balance on it, a visa, uh, a student loan, um, or even a car payment, which is obviously one of the bigger ones, those are the things that are really gonna draw back um, your affordability options when looking to purchase real estate. So again, have a proactive conversation. Um, if there are any credit concerns or anything you can work on, those can be addressed up front and not at the very last minute. 
Typically, when you're investing in real estate, you're looking to scale your portfolio, right? So fixed rate products come with some penalties if you ever break a mortgage. And typically, when you're looking to scale, you might be breaking your mortgages to scale. So something to consider on the fixed then is maybe it gives you some comfort in terms of payment, but make sure someone's having an educational discussion on you that, hey, if you break these mortgages, there's some penalties associated with doing so. On the opposite end, on the variable end, penalties for breaking those mortgages are much lower. So again, uh, make sure you're having a conversation with a professional. They're gonna educate you on fixed versus variable options. And ultimately, the interest rate chosen should be the one that gives you flexibility to scale your rental portfolio. So the main pro that comes to mind is being able to close on almost any real estate transaction. Maybe you found a property, needs a lot of work, and a conventional lender won't finance it. Maybe it's in a certain location that's outside the location realms that some lenders will finance. Uh, maybe it's a super quick closing. Maybe you're self-employed and you're not showing enough earnings on paper, but in the real world, uh, you are making the money that you need to qualify for the deal, but a big bank won't see that on paper. Um, private financing can be utilized to ultimately allow you to close on a transaction um, in a quick and timely manner. Some of the cons that come to mind are obviously there's a bit of a premium in terms of rate options in the private lending world and there are some fees to help close those transactions as well. So one of the rules of thumb with private lending is make sure that you have an exit strategy. Are you looking to sell the property later? Are you gonna renovate it and then maybe refinance it later and move it to a conventional lender? Um, are you self-employed and maybe you're working on structuring your taxes so that you can qualify with a different lender and get yourself out of that private mortgage later? Having an exit strategy um, is the main rule of thumb because no private mortgage option is meant to be long-term, so make sure you're having the discussions up front and that you have a game plan to make sure that although you utilize the private lender to take on the project that you wanted, that you're able to get out of it as well. Great question. So we actually had a client working directly with his bank. He was trying to acquire his fourth property and they told him, sorry, no, you don't qualify to do this. So he reached out to us via social media. We collected his documentation and we had a look at the file. Um, we noticed that we could make a small change to one of his existing mortgages slash properties and improve the terms on that mortgage. After doing that, he was able to qualify for his fourth property with that very same lender that told him that he couldn't do that. So again, as you look to scale your real estate portfolio and grow, um, having a mortgage agent or a mortgage team in your corner that has underwriting experience and can identify opportunities to get you to where you wanna be is super important. I think the most important piece of information is that if you're a new investor, make sure you build your power team before you go out and try to build your portfolio. Find that realtor that you're needing, find that lawyer that you're needing, find an appraiser, find a mortgage agent, find those people and make sure that you trust them and that they're giving you advice um, based on their own dealings, based on maybe doing the things that you're wanting to do, uh, making sure that they practice what they preach. So um, yeah, my number one piece of advice, my number one piece of information I wanna share to any new investors is don't do it alone, build your power team, and that's how you'll build your portfolio. Thanks for watching. My name's Ashton Lambert with Synergy Mortgage Group, and that concludes the mortgage side of what you'll wanna know as a rookie real estate investor. I hope you take this information and you use it to accelerate your wealth. Okay, so I uh, just want to give a shout out to Isaiah putting on a great event. Shout out to all you guys for showing up as well. Okay, um, so my name is Ashton Lambert. Um, I'm a mortgage agent with Synergy Mortgage Group. I've been in the mortgage industry for probably about eight years now, worked my way through the administration roles. Um, and then I was an underwriter for five years. Um, that underwriting role, I'm very grateful for that because the average mortgage agent, they'll do about 25 files a year average underwriter, they'll see thousands a year. So I was able to kind of see all the mechanics of why a file works, why it doesn't work, what lenders want to see, et cetera. Um, and that's allowed me to propel what I do now as a, a full-time mortgage agent, um, is that underwriting experience. So uh, that's my journey. That's me. If you can flip to the next slide, Taylor, that'd be awesome. Cool. Um, now I'll be honest with you guys, I, I sat around and I kind of figured, I, I talked to myself like what I really want to present today. Um, and there's a theme I kind of want to 
lay out for you guys. And that's just about planning proactively. I'm gonna say that probably 15 times, but I think it's super important. Okay, so a question for everyone in this room. Um, I know some people own some properties here already, but how many people, let's say in the next year, wanna buy another property or buy their first property? Just raise your hand. Cool, that's what I was hoping for. If you guys didn't do that, then this would've went south. <laughs> cool, okay, next six months. Anyone in the next six months maybe wanna buy a property, their second property, raise your hand. Cool, okay, now for me personally, like my opinion, I think whenever you're trying to buy, whenever you're planning to buy, um, just always plan proactively for that, okay? I'm gonna give you guys some prime examples. These are real uh, file examples of things that I've uh, encountered um, that if we didn't have a proactive conversation, some things could have went wrong, okay? Now I know sometimes um, I'm a mortgage agent, I'm also in sales, okay? Um, sometimes people don't wanna have mortgage conversations because maybe they feel like they're gonna be pushed to buying sooner than earlier or, or what have you, right? Um, but these are some examples I just wanna give you guys on whether it's myself, whether it's someone else you're working with, on why at least you should plan proactively, proactively and have a conversation proactively, okay? So the first story, um, girlfriend and a boyfriend, they hit me up on Instagram, um, wanted to buy in six months, looked at their income, everything was fine, pulled the credit for the girlfriend, boom, 17 missed late payments on a cell phone. Not good, uh, kind of awkward, because now I, now I have to ask, right? Um, so I got them on the phone and I asked her, hey, what happened here? She had no clue. Identity fraud, someone took out a cell phone in her name, her credit was in disarray, to say the least. Uh, you can imagine calling a cell phone service provider in Equifax Canada, is not an overnight uh, solution. Took months to solve that, to solve that issue, right? Um, luckily, these guys conversed with me about six months in advance of wanting to buy. So we solved that, it took a couple of months to solve it, and they were able to green light and buy within the time frame that they wanted to. If they didn't have that conversation, and maybe, um, hey Ashton, it's Sunday, we're looking at houses, can you pre-approve us? Probably would've went a different way, right? Okay, uh, story number two, this comes up a lot. Um, Funds from out of country and down payment in general. Um, essentially had these clients, they were working with someone else. Um, they were referred to me for a second opinion. They had already had a pre-approval kind of assessment done up for them and they were actively looking at houses. Well, tying it back to my role as an underwriter, a bit of PTSD from seeing things go wrong. Um, I ask every time I meet a client, where is your down payment coming from? Okay, I could pre-approve you all day, but when you buy a house, lenders ask for your source of down payment. These people were like, oh, there's a family gift coming from Turkey, okay? <laughs> well, most lenders require any funds from out of country to be in a Canadian bank account for a minimum of 90 days before you can use them. Uh, good news, we asked them that. They didn't buy a house firm with no conditions, so I asked them that up front. Um, bad news is house hunt is on hold, okay? But if they had had a proactive conversation, maybe that wouldn't have happened, okay? Um, so if anyone has money coming from Turkey, just chat with a mortgage lender now, okay? Uh, last one, this was a friend of mine. Um, she's a nurse and she was working at the hospital. She made good money, wanted to buy in the next six months. Um, and essentially in her mind, uh, maybe you guys would know that this isn't the case, but in her mind, she was being actually converted to a consulting role and she was gonna basically go to different um, health, in health facilities and do nursing work, but she was gonna be considered a contractor. So essentially she was making good money as an employee, as an employee um, but was offered a job to basically go self-employed and make two X what she was making. She's like, oh sick, I'm gonna make two times the amount of money that I make now. Uh, no, you're self-employed, most lenders want two years of self-employed income before you can use it, despite the real world, you making a lot of money, okay? Um, so we had that conversation, she was able to align her career and her house buying um, search to make sure she was able to do both, and that came from having a proactive conversation, okay? Um, I think I said proactive 15 times, I'm probably gonna say it 15 more times. Um, Taylor, if you can, just wanna kinda show you guys um, different versions of pre-approvals. Everyone, I would think, know what a pre-approval is, but there's different versions. I'm gonna show you guys some visuals. Um, and again, this is kinda my opinion on what I think things should look like. The first one is what I don't think things should look like. If you can just click that, uh, yeah, there should be a hyperlink in the top. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, sorry. Boom. I 
if my laptop's on data. Okay. Um, can you just go to like the middle if you can, Taylor? Okay, so um, I am not knocking banks by any means. There's a lot of awesome people at banks, okay? But more often than not, um, this is what a client gave me. I basically took their information out. I took the brand of the lender out. But more often than not, when you're pre-approved, you're given one max purchase price and you're sent on your way, okay? Um, so right here it says maximum amount pre-approved, $624,461.74. When I see that, I ask, what does that mean? Based on what purchase price, based on what down payment? Um, are you buying a townhome and there's condo fees? Are you buying a condo and there's higher condo fees? What does that really mean, right? Um, it doesn't give you like a budgeting breakdown on what you need to close on the property. Is it a rental? Are you house hacking? Maybe there's a second unit in it. Many things come up, right? Furthermore, um, if you dive into this kind of verbiage that's put, it, put within this letter, it essentially says like, once you buy a property, we'll look at your application and we'll underwrite it. So they don't actually underwrite your file up front. They just put your income into a calculator and they generate a number and then you're free to go house hunt. Well, what if they didn't ask you about your down payment, but they gave you this letter? Well, you would think, your realtor would probably think, oh, this letter's awesome, we can buy this house. And then the down payment's from Turkey and you can't buy the house, right? So things like that come up. Um, Taylor, if you can flip to the next uh, hyperlink that I put in there. You do, run out, you do run out of breath up here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fire away. Um, so based on that purchase price, was that minus a down payment? Like they didn't give a 5%, 10%? Uh, it, was just, it was just a mortgage amount that they, that they pre-approved the client for. Mm -hmm. The client didn't know what the down payment was because who knows even what the purchase right. price would be, right? right? Maybe that was for an $812,000 home with 15% down. Do, do, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, no one knows. The answer is no one, no one knew. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, again, this is my opinion, guys. There's a lot of awesome people that work at banks. There's a lot of awesome mortgage agents as well. Um, hopefully by the end of this slide, we agree which slide gives, which uh, attachment gives more clarity. Um, if we don't agree, I'm sorry. But <laughs> this is essentially the spreadsheets I like to give clients, okay? Um, it's pretty generalized. I just did it based on 5% down. Maybe your investing journey is different. You need different down payment. But essentially, I don't ever want to be the mortgage agent. I don't think this is the right way to do it for people either, where, hey, here's your max. See you later. Let me know when you buy a home. Buying a home is a big deal, OK? Uh, you got to make sure you're comfortable with that payment. You're absorbing a five-year term. If you go to the mall and you take a cell phone contract out and it's one or two years, and you're dealing with a sketchy guy at a cell phone booth, you're usually pretty weary of the terms, right? Well, most mortgage terms are five years. So you better be pretty comfortable um, with what you're getting into. I find these scenarios help clients find that comfort point, okay? Um, just to verbalize a little more, scenario one and two, maybe you wanna buy for four, 450. But hey, scenario three and four, if you find a property and there's an in-law suite or a second unit in it, hey, with $1,200 of rental income, you qualify for this. Hey, with $1,400 of rental income, you qualify for this, okay? Just to get people thinking, um, and giving them options and ultimately making sure that like you're comfortable with what you're getting into or you're able to give this to your realtor and they can kind of tailor your search um, based on what's comfortable for you and based on what you qualify for. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, don't want to toot my own horn, but is this one better than the other one? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Fair enough. Cool. Um, so obviously you guys went through kind of the pre-approval assessment. And again, what I wanted to bring to you guys today is like what I think you should be looking for um, in the home financing journey. If you're just starting, um, if you get a good grasp of comfort up front and you're getting good advice and structure up front, then long term, that's going to benefit you as you acquire more properties and you purchase, you refinance and you shuffle around. Okay. Um, so what I like to tell people after you're pre-approved, is you should always be in touch with your mortgage agent as you house hunt. You guys saw before, like um, the first attachment was one purchase price. The other um, scenarios I gave were variations of price points, right? Okay, well maybe now you're gonna go look at properties and you find one and you wanna make an offer. Say that property is listed for 480. You wanna offer 480? Well, have your mortgage agent look at the MLS listing, ask you what the plan for the property is, and give you a tailored breakdown specific to that property before you make an offer on it. 
Okay? Um, I find that gives clients the ultimate clarity to make sure what they're offering is comfortable and that uh, they're good on the options as opposed to just buying and then sourcing out what that looks like later. Okay? Um, if your offer is accepted, again, this ties back to proactive planning. Before you make an offer, I think your mortgage agent should be asking you what's the plan for the property. Isaiah touched on five, six, seven different real estate strategies. Okay? The offer um, post acceptance, you're going to get mortgage advice based on what your plan for the property is. It's not always about the lowest rate option. It's about what are your plans. Are you looking to renovate it? Uh, are you looking to buy and hold? Are you looking to refinance in the future? Um, Taylor, if we can click the refinance. Yeah, sorry. Maybe you're looking to refinance in the future, which Isaiah touched on as well. Hey, maybe you've bought a house and you want to see what the future refinance looks like. For example, you bought for 500K. Um, you estimate after renovating the property that maybe it's worth six, 625 or 650. Well, hey, here's what you can take in terms of proceeds if the project goes well, okay? Um, proactive planning, seeing those transactions in advance will give you guys the clarity uh, when you acquire your first property, second, third, and fourth, okay? Cool, and then just some closing thoughts for me. I feel like I should have brought sunscreen even though there's no lights, but <laughs> whew, okay. Um, question for everyone, you don't have to answer, it's rhetorical, but can you absolutely guarantee that when you buy a property, you're gonna own it forever or for at least five years? If you can guarantee that, um, Please give me some picks for the NFL games at four o'clock. Okay. Um, the advice you're getting for a mortgage product, um, again, it's always based on what your plans are. Um, about 61% of Canadians, according to CMHC, which is Canada's biggest mortgage insurer, break their mortgage at the three and a half year mark. Okay. Uh, divorce, global pandemic, job loss, refinance, sell, whatever it is. Okay. Um, we're taught to always look for the lowest rate option. Most of the time, those lowest rate options don't come with flexibility. So make sure you're always being asked, or at least you know, uh, what your plans are for that property so that you're getting the right advice and you're never kind of handcuffed uh, within your mortgage product, okay? Um, and then just kind of as you grow, as you grow, um, I think expertise and experience with the mortgage agent that you're working with or the lender that you're working with just matters more and more, okay? When you have multiple transactions going on, you're pulling money from this source, trying to buy another property. Those deals and those files don't always work with the same lender. They might work with a multitude of different lenders. So if you have someone who has underwriting experience and who has seen that, um, they can optimize your initial transaction as well as maybe the other ones that are ongoing. Okay. Uh, a few examples of why that matters. I always like to tell clients kind of what's happening with lenders behind the scenes and why this lender works or why it doesn't. If I was a client, and my mortgage agent said, hey, here's the option. I'd want to know, okay, well, why is this the option? Why, why'd you bring me this solution? Here are some reasons you guys are uh, maybe starting your real estate investing journey or, or you're within it now. Um, as you acquire more properties, lenders ask more questions, okay? So a couple things that you might not know. Some lenders want lease agreements for properties. Some don't, okay? Some lenders use um, more rental income than others. Some might use 100% of your estimated annual rental income. Some may use 50, makes a big difference. Some may use more, some may use less, okay? Um, this one's interesting, but some lenders wanna know where your refinance funds are going. If you're taking money out, some lenders will ask, okay, hey, well, where's this going? Are they buying something else? Do we have to build that in, okay? Um, some lenders let you use your own appraiser, others don't. Um, Isaiah can speak to the power of the appraisal, okay? Like, you wanna be able to control that, uh, that appraiser, okay? You don't want some random appraiser going out and saying, yeah, yeah, and given the value, you want an appraiser who like maybe you know within your network, um, who's trusted and who can maximize the return on some of the projects you take on, okay? Um, and this one's interesting too. Some lenders allow gifted funds on rentals, others don't. Um, so some lenders say you're getting a family gift and you're buying a rental property. Some lenders are cool with that, some aren't, okay? So just some food for thought on why experience and different lending solutions and working with someone who has a grasp on that really matters as you look to scale. Um, and just ultimately, I up the font here because it's important. Uh, proactive planning, always. That's it.